So if you can just share that with your stream and then we can get started. Mm -hmm. But I see that it's still locked. Um, you have to refresh, refresh the page. Yeah. Refreshing. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so I want to share this. Good morning, Elaine. How are you? Hi there. I'm good. You're going to stick with us, right? <laughs> I'm just going to try. Going to try. Okay. So we're going to get started. Um, everybody, please mute your okay. mic. And Shira. Hi. I don't know the lady with mask in the background. Megan. Hi, I'm Megan. Hi, Megan. You're going to get to know her very quickly. Say <laughs> there. <laughs> everybody, please mute your mics. And I am going to Hi. Say that. Hey. Okay, if you're not going to mute it, I'll mute it for you. <laughs> okay. And let's get started. Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Ifat, your G Plus go to gal. And today in What's Your Story is Megan Peters from Mashable. She's a community manager. And I actually met Megan at South by Southwest when she was on a panel with Daria Mask and um, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Escobar, um, something oh, right, Megan? Esteban Contreras. Megan, you're muted, so you need to oh. unmute yourself. Sorry. Um, yes, and TJ Marchetti. Okay. Um, yes, yes, much better. Okay. <laughs> and so Megan uh, was generous enough to agree to come and tell us how talk about her job and who she is and how she got to where she, uh, she is today as the community manager of Mashable. So let's start with you telling us just how, what brought you to where you are today. Yeah. Um, so I came to Mashable. Okay. Still? Sit. Yes. Oh. Now you can? No. Yes. Sorry, hang on. That's okay, you're good. We can hear you. Is that better or? Perfect. Okay. Um, good deal. Um, yeah, so I started at Mashable um, about a year and a half ago. Um, but before that, I was actually living in Seattle where I was working as a digital journalist at the Seattle Times. Um, and there, I, yeah, I did a lot of web production and was making the site and picking up news from the web um, and presenting it on the site. Uh, but that's really when I got into social media and I was running um, the, the Twitter and Facebook accounts for the sports page there um, and that was really fascinating and a really cool community to work with and um, I decided that I wanted to do a lot more than that and I heard about the Mashable opportunity and it just kind of came to that um, and the, the job that I had before the Seattle Times was um, in marketing at Microsoft and that I think was a really good experience because I feel like kind of what I'm doing now is a really good mix of what I was doing at Microsoft and then what I was doing at the Seattle Times because um, it's, it's like you need to understand the idea of marketing and spreading your message but you also need you know, doing community management for a news company, you need to have good news judgment and to understand what a story is and be able to anticipate how people will, re will react to it and from there also how you can help shape the conversation and engage people around a certain current event. So that's very interesting. Um, yeah. So many interesting facts there actually, but the first mm -hmm. one that jumped to my head is that uh, you're a woman and you're doing sports. What type of sports were you reporting? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was doing all different types. Um, I wasn't uh, 
I was mostly just doing things on the web, so less actual beat reporting, um, but more helping the other reporters like kind of maintain their blogs and tweeting out their stories and things like that. Um, so it was everything from like high school sports was really big in that region. Um, so like high school football was always huge to like basketball. I mean, um, Seattle doesn't have a basketball team anymore, unfortunately, but college basketball was huge and college football as well. And then the Seattle Seahawks um, were huge every year. And then the Mariners in the summer were the baseball team. So it was really all sports, um, but it just depended on the season and the point of year um, which ones I was working with. But I did a little bit of everything since I wasn't stuck to one certain beat, which I loved personally. I thought it was great. I got a really good experience. That's very. Is, do you have any uh, favorite sports that you that you liked? Yeah. Well, I guess for me, um, I was always a soccer player, and Seattle got a soccer team. Um, you know, not long before I started the Seattle Times, so that was super exciting to be able to work with them um, and keep up on that news because, yeah, like Seattle turned into actually a huge soccer town once the team came and, yeah, people just love, they're the Seattle Sounders and people love them out there. So, yeah, I would go to the games pretty frequently and um, I always loved that. I think that that was probably my favorite sport that I got to be involved in coverage with. That's my favorite too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so how do you really, like what you were saying, you need to find out what the real story is and what a story is in general, yeah. how to uh, report that and run the conversation. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing to keep in mind when you're looking for a story or considering a pitch for a story is how many people that topic affects. So, for example, like a lot of what I would do there was actually moving around different stories on the home page and putting their placement to be in order of best importance. So, importance is basically how many people it affects um, or, you know, how, yeah, how many people are talking about it um, or might, you know, benefit or need to hear about it for whatever reason. So, um, yeah, I think like a really good example is uh, there was a story about how some research came out about like certain um, ideas we have, I think, about breast cancer were totally debunked by some research story that came out. Um, and, you know, that's a disease that affects a lot of people in our world. So that was the top story of the day, whereas something like a movie review, even though, yeah, that's timely and it's coming out maybe the next day or in a couple of days, it isn't you kind of have more of a niche entertainment crowd whereas something like breast cancer is really everyone because you know what either you know someone in your family has it or you might have it or you, chances are you know someone who knows someone who has it so you have to kind of think about it like that um, but then of the same token being in Seattle and covering local news like even if it isn't a national story like, you know, something with cancer, it could also be something local where like a huge, um, you know, statewide bill just passed that really affects the university's education budget or something. And that could also be a top story because that's, you know, all the taxpayers' money in that region that's being affected and how it's being used. And there also is, you know, if it's a university of 40,000 people where, a large portion of the state sends their children that could, you know, have a huge effect on also a large portion, maybe even not all across the country or the world, but in that region. Would you get your stories from press releases that were sent to you, or would you go out and look for the stories? Um, sometimes it's press releases, but a lot of times it's going out and looking for stories. Or even, I mean, there are so many places you can find stories. Even just having a conversation with someone and hearing things that they're interested in or questions they ask or connections they might have that, you know, might be an interesting person to interview. Um, there's definitely lots of different ways stories come out. How does it work in Mashable right now? How do you guys get your stories? Yeah, for us, um, I mean, some of it is press releases um, that come into our inbox, but a lot of times, I mean, we're all very much into social media, so we, I mean, especially because it's a huge coverage area for us, so we have, 
people who are just monitoring like Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, even like Pinterest and all these various sites, you know, looking out for stories and seeing just seeing what people are talking about, and understanding what's at top of mind for everyone on the web helps to give us some direction as to, you know, what the news of the day is because what people are talking about or what they're interested in and that's what we want to hit on. And so you're using all the all the social media mm -hmm. uh, aspects, Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, and you are now uh, being featured by Google, right, as one of the companies that is using Google Plus mm -hmm. uh, with the best practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So can you tell us how Mashable is using Google Plus and what does it do for your company? Like in what ways you're using it? Yeah, absolutely. So we um, we got on Google Plus like from the get-go. It was something that we really wanted to be on and we wanted to experiment with the community. Um, the thing we found very early on with Google Plus is it's very engaging and people really, really like to have discussions. Um, I mean, of course, Hangouts are a great example of that. Like we've done a couple with some of our reporters and they've been fascinating. To me, a Hangout is really the deepest kind of engagement you can get on social media. Uh, we had a great one a couple months ago where a reporter was on, she was actually talking about carrier IQ when that was a big deal a couple months ago and kind of educating people about it because a lot of people didn't really understand exactly what the issue was and it was, you know, basically um, about being tracked on your mobile phone, them having these inherent devices that could do that and, you know, people were freaked out by it but they also didn't really understand what it meant or how they could figure out if it was an issue for them. So she got on talking about this and then someone that was in the Hangout actually happened to be an expert on the topic and it sort of almost became like a very fluid conversation between them where they together were almost really like were educating other people and relaying this information that actually ended up turning up out into a follow-up interview that she used for another story on the site, like interviewing this guy. So things like that don't happen on all social sites. Like that was a really cool way that we got to use Google+. Plus. Um, and we've also, I mean, we post our stories, of course, um, but sometimes we also crowdsource. Like it's a really good tool for that. Um, the other day when Gmail was down, we asked folks, you know, what their experience was like. Um, and kind of took a little survey and got some information from their experiences to be able to piece together like a story was come back there. like how the problem might might affect you. So that so do you find that you get more of the news from Google Plus or like Twitter that is you know more kind of like mm -hmm. a newsy medium? Yeah, I mean, I think personally, um, I find a lot of news from Twitter, but I think that the thing about the news I find from Google Plus is that it's always different. Um, and that's, I really like that. I like there are things that get posted here that I would never come across on Twitter. And I think a lot of, I know even like photos and videos, I feel like are just so much easier to see in the format of Google Plus. So I tend to watch a lot more really interesting videos from Google Plus than I would for Twitter, but Twitter I'd say I probably find most of the articles that I like to read. It's interesting. Can you tell me what's, uh, what a day in the life of Megan Peters is like? Oh man, oh that's a hard question because it's different every day. Um, but I guess I'd say, you know, like I come to the office and we we look at like what's going on and like considering what the top news of the day is, we all always get together at noon and have a meeting to kind of go over like what performed well the day before and you know how we can do better like the next day and what types of stories we want to have an eye on, what people are talking about, what trends we're seeing overall um, is really important. Um, but yeah, it could be, I mean I think the most interesting thing about my job is that I really span all departments here. So yes, I work really closely with editorial and finding the news, but on any given day I could also be helping like our events and marketing team to set up like a Twitter fall of 
like tweets and Instagram photos for our next event that people can look at when they come in. Or I could be talking to our sales team about, you know, um, selling a contest package to an advertiser and how we would engage our readers on the site. Um, or I could be, yeah, we're really working with like <laughs> any like number of people here on any given day, which is what I really like because I really enjoy, you know, kind of helping to bring things together. And I think the thing about community is that we really understand what our audience likes, who they are, and, you know, how we can engage with them and tap into them and, you know, use them as a resource but also provide more utility for them. So that really, really affects everyone at our company because we're so community first. We really care about, you know, making sure our goals are in line with what our readers come to us for. So I, I'd say, like, I get pulled in a lot just to let people know, you know, what the Nashville readers are talking about and, you know, how we can make the most of it. Do you find that you have different communities on different networks, that your community on Google Plus is different from your Facebook one and your Twitter one? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, like our Google Plus community is definitely, um, they really, whenever we post stories on Google Plus, we try to focus on posting like opinion pieces or very kind of like thought out kind of analysis pieces. Um, and it's like when we post something to Google Plus, people want to see like our analysis of it and then maybe they'll read it and tell us what they think of it. So we can't really just post like one sentence sentence or a couple words as a prompt. It's like they want to see almost a couple paragraphs sometimes of what we think about it and basically why it's important to us before they decide that it's important enough for them to take their time to read and then respond to, um, which is really fascinating. Um, but definitely a really smart community on Google Plus that's you know, saying a lot of interesting things and has some really cool response. Um, but yeah, like Twitter is definitely different. Our Twitter community loves to share. Like we get tons of retweets, like way more than most accounts or, you know, accounts that I know, like friends I have who work on um, other big media accounts. Um, Facebook, our audience there's, I, in general, I think Facebook is just a lot more mainstream. So we, we try to post stories there that are applicable to like a, a wider audience, I guess. Whereas, you know, something like Google Plus, we can talk about that topic like Carrier IQ, how we did the Hangout. Whereas on Facebook, a story like that might not do as well because people there aren't as into tech where they would know like what that story is about as much. So let me ask you how it sounds like you never send the same story to, um, to all the networks. You basically modify the story and sometimes you're not even sending the same story to all of them. Yeah, so we, especially with Google Plus and with Facebook, um, I mean, if we post too much, we get really negative feedback. So we can't post all our stories there because we publish, I mean, probably between 50 and 70 stories a day sometimes, at, you know, at the high range. Um, so that, I mean, we can put all of them out on Twitter because people are used to their streams moving really quickly and, you know, the feed doesn't bother them. But on Google Plus, I'd say we post a maximum of probably five stories a day, whereas with, with Facebook, it's probably a little bit more than that, maybe like 10 stories a day. Um, so it's, I mean, it kind of depends on what's going on at the moment, but yeah, we do try to even if we were to post the same story to Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, the prompts would all be different, so we'd post them in different ways. Um, and I mean, I think that that's a smart thing for a community manager to do, no matter what platform or what brand they're working with. Because, I mean, a good example is like if you were to put out a tweet on Google+, and you had at handle mentions, like those don't translate to Google Plus because it's not the community, it's not the functionality of the site. So it's it makes more sense to modify it so that it would it would look proper in the stream, like be what people are expecting to see. 
So when you uh, when Google Plus started and you um, you're one of the first beta testers, mm -hmm. you're right. Um, when you got here, did you bring your community here with you, or did you cultivate a community from within Google Plus? That's a good question. I think it was a little bit of both. I um, I think also we we were pretty big on Google Buzz before um, that was. Uh, done away with. So I think that a lot of that community transferred. But I think Google Plus also, I mean, clearly became much bigger than Google Buzz. Um, so I think that because Google Plus built a whole new community, we were definitely able to tap into those folks and, you know, share with them what we were sharing and, um, yeah, build a huge community from that. Um, but that said, I do think that our audience is very much an early adopter type where they see the new tool coming out and they want to be one of the first ones on it. So I'd say in that sense we did have a lot of people who, you know, were already reading us that, you know, came with us to Google Plus, but they might also be following us on Twitter or on Facebook, um, which, is all, which is another way we actually use to build community on all these different platforms as we cross promote. So we might put out a tweet that says, hey, we're on Google+, Plus. add us to your circles, um, which can help us get a few folks who follow us on Twitter to also follow our updates on Google+, Plus, which is pretty cool. And it's definitely an effective way to, to build communities. When Google started in beta, they didn't have uh, brand pages. Mm -hmm. And you came into Google+, Plus as a company. So did you have one person representing Mashable with a personal profile and then switch to a brand page? What was the strategy behind that? Yeah, so that's what we did. I mean, we're very fortunate that our CEO, Pete Cashmore, is a very recognizable face. Um, so we used his profile um, where, I mean, it wasn't really even us. He was actually doing the updating because it was his and we weren't going to, you know, go into his account. But um, he, yeah, I mean, he really really liked the platform and would do a lot of that analysis right on Google Plus and he was able to gain a pretty big following really quickly um, and that was really cool to see and you know we just kept an eye on it. We would engage with people who were responding to his analysis um, to you know build community around Mashable and let them know that you know we worked with Pete at Mashable and we wanted to respond with them and, and hear more about what they were saying. So, yeah, that, that was a cool experience, but we were definitely very glad to have um, the brand pages launch because it's been a lot easier for us to manage and um, just nice for people to be able to connect with the brand. I mean, a lot of people are still connecting with Pete, which is great, but um, it's, yeah, it's nice to get people excited about the brand as well. And so how did you move people from personal profiles to start following Mashable? the brand itself? Yeah, so we um, we definitely did a lot of messaging um, where Pete would share the profile and at first like he would do less of his own posting and sh directly share the posts from the Mashable page onto his page to try to get folks to migrate over there. Um, and then we did a lot of marketing on the site as well. Um, we, I mean, we also write about Google Plus a lot from the news perspective. So, you know, in our posts, we would sort of have like in-house ads to let people know that we were on Google Plus. And that was really effective because, um, you know, if you're on that page reading an article about Google Plus, chances are you're on Google Plus yourself and might want to like get more updates like that from Mashable. So that was really helpful. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd say that um, also our, in addition to Pete, we also had a lot of other staff members who had gained large followings on Google+, Plus, so they were essential in spreading the word as well about the brand page. So um, I know you, uh, you told me you're, you love quotes. What's your yeah. one? Oh, my favorite quote. Um, oh, what is it? I gotta like pull up my Pinterest now. Um, cause I, like, all I do is like pin quotes to Pinterest boards. Um, I think my favorite one is, yeah, work hard, stay humble. I think that that's a really good one. Um, I'm pretty sure that's a Steve Jobs quote. Um, but, yeah, I just, 
I feel like if that could be my mantra every day, then life is kind of better, not just for myself, but for all around me as well. So that's important. Humble allows you to connect with people better, right? So yeah, that too. <laughs> so good other thing. Um, if you, uh, if you have, uh, if anyone today that you know is considering entrepreneurship today, do you have any words mm -hmm. of advice for them? Uh, entrepreneurship, you know, I think that being an entrepreneur is so much about risk management and knowing when to dive in head first and when to kind of, you know, maybe test the waters a little bit more and, you know, your judgment, your experience gets better with that with experience but um, I mean I think that you know you need to you need to be fast but you also need to do your research and make sure you understand all sides of a venture before you get into it um, I mean I think one thing that worked really well for Mashable when Pete started it in 2006 is that he you know he had been watching the space from the very beginning and he it was really risky at first that you know he started writing about things like Twitter and Facebook and people would even say like why are you doing that like that's not going to be a thing like they're just networks where people are like you know talking to their friends or posting pictures from parties and you know he stuck with it and it took a while he really really had to put some time in and it's I think that was really key as well, having that patience to be able to see it through because it wasn't really until maybe like two or three years in that he really started to see a lot of success and gain some serious traction to the point where, you know, he's been able to grow the company to be, gosh, we have nearly 70 employees now and a headquarters in New York and an office in San Francisco. So it's, it's really turned into something big, but it took a lot of patience and perseverance and time. We were talking about how, you know, when someone, something is very successful, the, the media always talks about an overnight success. And an overnight yep. success <laughs> takes about yeah. you know, 10, 10 years. <laughs> that happens very rarely, yeah. I mean, even like, I feel like even something like Instagram can be argued as an overnight success, but in reality, that took a year and a half. And... I mean, that's not, that's not a lot of time, but it's also not the next day. So, yeah. And actually, you know, you're talking about Pete. Pete is very much, um, um, I would say, an innovator, but he also you can see kind of like the future because Mashable, a lot of companies still today are not in Google+. Mm -hmm. and yeah, Mashable that's true. There, right? When it was still beta and yeah. not available to the public. Yeah, that, that was really important for us to be on there at the beginning. Um, and, I mean, it, it definitely was a risk because, you know, it's, it could have been a complete failure and we could have put tons of time and effort into promoting our presence and to updating our page, um, you know, without much benefit. But it ended up working out because Google Plus has, you know, built a large user base and it does have a lot of power behind it. And, like, at the same time, I think that getting on there right away was really beneficial because we being one of the first ones, we were able to, I think it was easier to build a larger community because, you know, with there being less people and less brands on it, we were, you know, we had less competition, I guess, in that sense. So that was definitely a good thing. Um, but at the same time, kind of how I was saying, like, being able to see, like, all points and have a well-rounded view of what you're getting yourself into was important for us. And, you know, we had seen Google's ventures into social before we had been done plenty of stories about, you know, Google's plan for the future and like where they saw every saw everything going and with how much they were investing in Google Plus, we felt like it was a safe decision to also invest in it because it wasn't something that was going to be launched and then completely abandoned. We knew they were planning to grow it and continue developing it. And, you know, we knew that we could keep up with them on that. So can you tell me how do you build the community on Google Plus? How do you, um, mm -hmm. do you engage with them? Do you reach out and find new people? What do you do to maintain a community? Yeah. Um, I'd say in terms of building community, we, I mean, we do a lot of different things. A lot of it is just 
having interesting posts that people want to share with their own networks and sort of getting that viral effect, that's really important to us. Um, but also the cross promotion is pretty key for us as well um, in terms of, yeah, like getting um, getting our Twitter followers to also follow us in Google Plus and vice versa. So um, there's a lot of different ways, but I mean, I think that just really posting articles or starting conversations through Hangouts or whatever it may be is really key for us in terms of the building community because, you know, when we ask a question and someone responds, then we actually get to know who those people are. So it's not, so a lot of times people use the word community and it could mean something very vague. But for us, like, it's really about getting to know this audience and, you know, having a two-way conversation so that they feel just as invested in, you know, our brand and our mission as we are in, in them and their interactions with us. Do you do also uh, community building activities, kind of like competitions and mm -hmm. uh, you do? What's yeah, the, we do. What's the best one that... Um, that worked well for you, like a good competition? Yeah. I think one that I've, I've really liked that we've been doing, we started actually a weekly feature, it's called our weekly photo challenge, where we give our community a different like topic every week um, and have them go out and take pictures of whatever it is. So um, our, a couple weeks ago when Instagram first launched for Android, the topic was first. So we left that up to anyone's interpretation. If you want that to be your first Instagram picture on your Android, if you want that to be, you know, your first baby coming home from the hospital, if you want it to be like your first time in Maui, whatever it be. And we got really, really interesting interpretations and just tons of submissions. And then we did a roundup gallery with some of the best ones. And that was a really cool project. But yeah, we've been doing, so then the week after that we did progressions and now we've launched a new one just this week, um, actually today, that's, uh, the topic is green, so that could be anything from, you know, maybe like an eco-friendly system that you have to just, you know, a day in the park or whatever it be. So that one's been really, really cool and people really, really like to get involved with that one. Do you find that different type of competition work on different networks? So, for example, picture yeah. would go work better in Google Plus and something else mm -hmm. would go better in Twitter? Yeah, definitely. Um, Google Plus is really important for pictures. Videos do really well in Google Plus as well. Um, similar to Facebook, uh, pictures do phenomenally, phenomenally on um, Facebook. Uh, videos do okay on Facebook, but not as, I mean, pictures are just amazing there. Um, and yeah, I'd say like, it also depends on, yeah, it really depends on what audience is on what platform, what does well. So for example, like if we have something, a post about um, maybe something job or more business related, we'll put it on LinkedIn and usually it'll per perform very well there. Whereas kind of our more offbeat news or really striking visuals tend to do well on a network like StumbleUpon. So it really, it really just depends on the content and what audience is there to receive it. It sounds like what you're trying to do is really to get uh, viral in shares. Did you figure mm -hmm. out what triggers the viral? Um, it's always a combination of things. Timing is really, really important. Um, I think a really good example is um, around the Super Bowl, there was this photo of uh, Bill Belichick, the Patriots coach, kind of floating around the internet where he just, like, I don't know, it was after practice and he just, like, kind of had this look on his face and, like, long, hard day of practice kind of a thing. Um, and it was sort of, sort of started to circulate, so we invited our community to actually make it into a meme and we provided a cutout image that they could use to paste on, you know, wherever they wanted to put it and put their, layer their own wording over it to, you know, just kind of poke fun at this guy. And we posted it, I think it was a day or two before the Super Bowl happened, so people just went nuts about it because that's all anyone was talking about at that moment was the Super Bowl. So, it, yeah, it really gain traction and that timing was just perfect and and I mean also the tools that we were able to provide them the fact that we actually could give them the picture 
to use made it a lot easier than if we just said, hey, do this. And then they had to go search for the picture themselves and then, then do all this stuff in Photoshop with the wording. It just wouldn't have worked. So um, I think, yeah, timing, available tools, uh, and sort of creative inspiration, because we also created our own as an example. And that kind of got people's wheels turning. So. Um, yeah, I'd say it's, it's a mix of the, the timing and also the tools and examples you can provide. Um, I see when you, I'm looking at your page and yeah. I notice there's a lot of responses to every one of your posts. And I'm kind of like scrolling through the comments and I'm seeing where you guys enter in and engage in the conversa conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's very random. Do you have kind of like a system? Do you wait for people to talk? Do you just respond for some of them or none of them? Is there any, anything behind that? Um, I mean, I'd say, uh, yeah, I can't say we necessarily have a strict method for that. Um, I think for us it's just important that we are getting back to people. Um, so it's, if someone asks a question, we'll do our best to answer it. I'd say like questions are kind of what we get to first. And if there are no questions or we've answered them, then we'll try to respond to interesting comments. Um, and I mean, even if it's just as simple as like, oh, thanks for your comment. That was really interesting perspective. Like sometimes that's enough. I mean, at the end of the day, people just really want to know that someone's listening and that there's someone there on the other end to see that comment so that they're not just kind of blindly throwing it into some sort of commenting abyss of the internet. Um, so that's, that's something that's really important for us and that we try to stay on top of for sure. I think that's actually what separates the successful brands on Google Plus from mm -hmm. the unsuccessful ones because I think this is a new way of really a two-way conversation whereas the, entire, the other networks it's more kind of like a one way. You send something out there and people share it and come yeah. but you don't really have the two-way conversation. And so it's, it's really nice to see companies who are doing it well and are getting back to their users and talking to them. And it sounds like to get your attention, to get Mashable's attention, is uh, ask a question <laughs> and mention Mashable yeah. in the comments. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you want to be noticed by, on Mashable, that's what you have to do. Guys. <laughs> um, tell me about yourself. What about, what's the most influential time, person, or moment in your life that got you to where you are today? Oh, man. Um, most influential time or moment. Um, there's a, I guess, like, on a personal level, I find my sister really inspiring. I know that's kind of cheesy, but it's true. Like, I think the thing about working in social media is, like, sometimes you get, ten, you tend to get caught up in this world of the internet and what all these people are saying on the different networks, and it can, it can be a little overwhelming at times, and also, you know, when when you're living in the comments and just listening to people all day, you know, someone sometimes people say mean things and, you know, it it can be kind of tough. But like I when I, you know, talk to my sister about what happened in my day at work, like she so she's a nurse, so she I mean, she's not even barely on a computer and I mean, she's like dealing with some really difficult situations day in and day out. So when I tell her about what's going on with me, I mean, she really helps put it into perspective by saying, you know, if you screw up at work, yeah, you might have a couple of disgruntled Twitter followers. If I screw up at work, someone might die. So it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to think about it that way, but it's true. And uh, I find that really inspiring and that really helps me keep going because it's, at the end of the day, like the things that I'm doing, yes, they're important and it's, you know, great to build community and to listen to all these conversations that are going on in real time, but at the same time, it's not a matter of life and death. <laughs> and that's important to, to know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, using your perspective, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, actually, that's um, you know uh, Elaine who just commented in the chat just reminded me of um, another quote that I really like. I can't remember the exact wording, but it was something Francis Ford Coppola said to his kids, and it was something to the effect of keep your work personal and you'll never get yourself caught up in a lie. And I think that that is really, really important because um, it's, you know, staying humble and staying honest is so key. And if you 
really feel so strongly about your work that you treat it the same way you would, you know, like a family situation or, you know, hanging out with friends or whatever it be, then I think that you're much better off for it and, you know, you're not, you're not going to get yourself into those lies because you care enough about it that you want to stay honest and you want to maintain respect. My, uh, my husband once told me, you know, don't turn it into a religion. It's something yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. You think sometimes you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's not my life. <laughs> right. Uh huh. Absolutely. Uh, what's your favorite book? Do you have time to read? Oh yeah. Um, actually, I know it's so silly, but I'm reading the Hunger Games book right now. Like, I always think that that's so silly when everyone's reading the same book. But finally, my friend cracked on me because she she was like, you have to read this so we can go see the movie. It's actually pretty good, but um. Not up there with my favorites yet. Um, I'd say my favorite, actually, I really like the Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie. I found that really inspiring. Um, and um, I'm also a huge Dave Eggers fan. He wrote uh, a heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius, and that's one of my favorites. Um, I've read a couple of, of other books of his as well, and I think that he's just phenomenal. Um, what's, what, uh, what accomplishment in your career? Oh, in your life right now, you're most proud of? Accomplishment I'm most proud of. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, uh, I'd say I've been really proud of what I've done at Mashable because I've been able, like as the company has grown, I've been able to you know, come into a management role and actually build a team, which has been really cool. I mean, because for a while, it was just me doing the community building at Mashable when we were really small. I mean, I was like employee 25, and now we're at nearly 70, and it's not just me. It's like me plus like four other people who are, you know, interacting with people every day, and it's been a really fascinating experience to, you know, um, learn how to to work with others and also help them develop and be happy in their careers and and you know make it a collaborative collective experience. So it sounds like your job has changed and morphed from like actually doing it to teaching others how to do it. Right, exactly. And that's been really amazing to me and definitely it, it, the thing about it too is that it happened really quickly um because we've just grown so fast. I mean, I've been here um a little more than a year and a half, I guess, co coming up on two years, and it's, yeah, it was seriously, like, we just kept growing so quickly that, I mean, yeah, within, like, six months, it was, like, I was already starting to learn how to train people, and that was interesting, because, like, I felt like there were still things I was learning myself, but, and I still am learning, of course, but I also think that that attitude of knowing that I can keep learning, and also, being willing to bring on people who I know I can learn from has been really key. This is actually very admirable because most people in that position are fearful of losing their job for someone, you know, training someone, teaching them what they know, and yeah. losing that. So that's actually right. really impressive. That you're, you know, it's a, it's a quick change and you're growing into that and you're comfortable with it. That's very okay. nice. But I've realized that it's not the way to go and I was just, you know, constantly stressing myself out and I've realized that it's, yeah, more of a, I mean, I need to treat it the same way where it's like a two-way street on the internet where I'm, like, having a fluid conversation with various commenters. It's like I need it to also be a two-way learning experience, you know, if I really want to reap the full benefits of, of, of having a team. What do you like better? Do you like doing it yourself better or having a team and teaching them how to do that, managing better? Um, I like having a team. I mean, I think it's fun. I, I do still, I think it's nice because I do have the flexibility to still actually get in there and be hands-on a lot. Um, but I think it's, I think that it's a better experience for our community to have various people to connect with. And, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and different perspectives. And I think that we approach situations differently. And I think that that's beneficial all around. And, okay, so talking about benefits, what's the yeah. biggest mistake that you've ever made and what did you learn from it? Oh, man. Um, 
I don't know if it was like the biggest mistake of a lifetime, but it was um, a really good learning experience, like especially getting into what I do now is um, I, when I was at the Seattle Times, I was doing, um, I was actually on our main page, on the news page instead of the sports day one day, and there was this story about um, this criminal who was being charged they were deciding that day if he was going to be charged with the death penalty um, for this murder that he committed. And I had posted it on the Facebook page, kind of thinking I could start a debate about the death penalty and, like, right or wrong. And, like, the feedback was just horrible. People were like, why are you trying to start this debate here? Like, this isn't the place for that. We don't want to talk about this here. And it was just a very, like, oh, okay. Like, it's. I mean, it wasn't the worst mistake ever, but I definitely, I mean, like, my boss was kind of like, what were you thinking? And I was like, I, I was thinking a different way. And, like, I think that was just a really eye-opening experience that, you know, in terms of, like, yeah, thinking about what you're doing and not just thinking about what kind of conversation is interesting to you, but what the way other people are going to perceive it. Because at the end of the day, like, when you're posting to social media, it's not about you. It's about everybody else. And and how they're going to interact and then continue to, you know, with this viral effect, continue to share it because people share good content and if it's presented to them in an appealing way, the chances of them continuing to share it with their networks are much greater. You just gave me an idea which is, uh, it's, it might be very interesting to try the same story just written in two different ways. And yeah. <laughs> right? And seeing how the community takes it. Yeah, it it is. No, they're definitely, the way you frame things is so important in what we do. It really is. So, if, uh, it, it's, it's funny because it's like, you know, it's kind of like puppeteering. Where, yeah. You know, it's, and, and I feel like the media does it sometimes. Mm -hmm. because you're kind of forced, right? You have your community, right. what they react to, and so mm -hmm. this is what you have to feed them. Yeah. And do you ever feel like you want to lead the conversation? Maybe, you know, see like rather than feeding them what they want making them giving them a leap you know like having them do something different yeah you mean like like doing so like getting them to engage differently or right so like instead I know you're going to react to this story if I write it this way but what if yeah. I you know give you something to think about outside of what you're normally used to yeah I mean, I think it always depends on the story in that sense. I mean, a big, a big facet of journalism is being objective and, you know, trying to not necessarily having um, an opinion, but, you know, presenting it in a neutral enough way so that, so that the commenters and the readers can form their own opinions. Um, I mean, that said, I guess I'd say, like, that's probably how I push the envelope the most is sometimes I probably do share a little bit more of an opinion than I, sh than I should given that kind of, um, I don't know, I guess like rule of journalism. Um, but at the same time, I think that that's just how the social web works. I think people would rather see my sincere reaction as a person um, Sometimes, and I mean, that that also depends on, like, the subject matter. I mean, you know, with with really, um, with kind of that more hard breaking news when you're talking about things like, you know, people dying or, like, explosions and earthquakes or whatever, like, that kind of thing, I think it's harder to do that with. But with something like, you know, a tech product review or like a new social feature, I feel like I have a little bit more leeway. So I, I try to save those things for when I post my personal accounts rather than Mashable's accounts because basically as a news organization, Mashable kind of shouldn't have an opinion. But that said, like, we do try to humanize it, I guess, and like that's important for us. If you were not a community manager at Mashable, what would you be? Oh, man. Um, I think I'd be a dog walker. Like, I, I have a dog, and I love her. <laughs> She's amazing. Um, or I'd have, like, I've always thought, you know what I've always wondered is, like, who has the job that puts names on nail polishes and lipsticks? Like, 
I don't know who does that or if that's even like a career path, but I would love to do that because they always have like the most ridiculous names. I just think it'd be really fun to like be painting these colors and come up with some, I don't know, like, I don't know, Cora and Bora or whatever it is. Kind of thing. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Making hurricanes, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the happiest day of your life? Oh, the happiest day of my life. Wow. Um, well, I'm not married, so <laughs> not that yet. Um, gosh. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think probably one of my best days was uh, every year Mashable we throw this event called Social Media Day. It's always on June 30th every year. Um, and it's this really cool kind of grassroots event where we actually use Meetup Everywhere to put out kind of a call to action where we just want people to organize events to celebrate social media and this, you know, this connected generation and this digital world that we live in. Um, and last year's was extremely successful. There were thousands of meetups in like 90 different countries all over the world. And um, I was really well connected with these various organizers who were putting them together. So that was, that was a really, really happy day for me to see, like actually see in front of my eyes, like the whole world come together and like actually celebrate together and how the internet and social media sites have let us do that and made that ability so possible, like with these various tools and also this mindset of, you know, connecting with people across the world that we might not know in person is totally normal. That's totally something we should be doing. And I think that that was, that day is sort of like the culmination of why I do what I do. And last year's being so successful was just awesome. And yeah, so hopefully in a year I'll be able to tell you that June 30th, 2012 is the new happiest day of my life. So I'm hoping that we have, you know, an even equally amazing, if not better, experience as we did last year. That's awesome. Actually, maybe this year, you know, uh, June 28th is Google Plus one year anniversary. And yeah. So, yeah, so it's like very, very close. Maybe with the Hangouts and stuff like that, you guys will come up with a brilliant idea of how to connect Hangouts in real life and Hangouts and Meetup. Yeah, yeah that would be, real. actually that would be a great idea. We should do some sort of Hangouts on Air project for Social Media Day. That'd be really cool. Awesome. Yeah. You, heard it, you heard it here first, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we got five more minutes. I know you have to leave. I'm going to open it up. Anyone yeah. who has questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and wrap away. I don't know, nothing today. If not, okay, I will, uh, I have one more. Um, I'll listen on it. Okay, personal heroes. Oh, personal heroes. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, you know who's one of mine is um, Matt Howey, the guy who started Metafilter, is really, really inspiring. I saw him speak a couple months ago at a conference. Um, and he, he's like in his early 40s, but he has like been doing internets and startups like since he was in his early 20s. So he's had like kind of 20 years and was one of these first internet pioneers and like has so many interesting experiences. And just like when he looks back on all that he's done and accomplished, like his, he just really cares about the people in his life, and I thought that that was fascinating, like, to hear him say that. It's interesting, right, how the people that really touch you is not just by yeah. serial achievement, but it's like the connection and relationship they make with people. Right, absolutely. It's, the, it's actually the effect that you have on your community. So it's, uh, yeah. It's interesting, which actually puts you in a very good position. <laughs> yeah, for sure. The community manager. Um, if we don't have any more questions, guys, I'm just really going to thank you so much for your time and being yeah. really honest and sincere. That was great. Of course. Thank yeah, you. That, that was, was great. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. And, um, and, and we'll see you again on Mashable. Thank you, what guys. What kind of dog? I know it's an off-topic question, but I had to ask. What type of dog? <laughs> oh, actually, 
She's around here somewhere. <laughs> um, she's bring your baby uh, definite yeah. dog person. Yeah, I, yeah. She's um, so she's an American half American Eskimo dog with a Kita mix. Oh wow! Nice. Yeah, she's really cute. I know. I um, I don't know where she is right now. She's roaming around somewhere. We're allowed to bring our dogs to the office, so That's yeah, excellent. she comes and hangs out. Yeah, it's really cool. She's. I actually. I post. I have some pictures of her on my uh, Google Plus profile. Oh, so, I will check it out. Yeah, check it out. She's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> she has a cute dog also. And uh, actually, last uh, last interview, she was saying that people smile at her dog, which is what makes her day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a nice one. That yeah, that always makes me happy. People are very friendly when you have a dog. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually good to hear that women get the same attention that guys get with dogs, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and I, and again, I have uh, four Pomeranians. Oh wow! Yeah. What? <laughs> Gosh, Pomeranians are adorable. Four of them, though. That's yeah, a lot. Four, yeah. Yep. They all get along well. They, yeah, they do. Three of them are related, and then one is um, separate family. But yeah, they, they all get along. Twenty little... Pomeranians, Adam. Four, four. No, four. no, Adam said he grew up with twenty. Oh, oh, wow. wow. That's amazing. I have a pair of Yorkies. Oh, those are cute. Yeah. We awesome. have a, a Maltese Yorkie mix that comes to the office too. Mm -hmm. One of our editors. So I'm assuming no one here participates in Cats Day. Well, actually, I was going to say, no, we have a 20-year-old uh, Pixie Bob cat that's American Lynx and Minnesotan Barn Cat. Oh, wow. And she fetches better than a dog. She goes and visits the neighbors. She's very dog-like. <laughs> <laughs> She's why we keep her around. <laughs> and, and at least twice wow. the size of both my other dogs. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> well, thanks again. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Megan. And we'll see you next week. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.